We have lots to cover in today's video, including the latest off-season trade talk. Today, we're focusing on teams like the Montreal Canadiens, Toronto Maple Leafs, Philadelphia Flyers, and the Columbus Blue Jackets. We also have the latest rumors around who might be the next Columbus Blue Jackets general manager. We have a few signings to discuss, including the Islanders landing, one of the top European free agents on the market this year. We have our Bill Masterton award winner as well. Lots more updates from the Stanley Cup playoffs and more coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot of news to cover here today. Uh, before we jump into the hockey-related news, I just want to touch on another piece of news. Uh, we've lost another legendary broadcaster here in the country of Canada. I know my Canadian viewers will certainly be familiar with this broadcaster. Uh, American viewers, you may, at least I, I think to some degree. But TSN's Darren Detition has sadly passed away at the young age of 57. Uh, Darren Detition um saskatchewan born very proud of that made that known everywhere huge personality um you know the voice was a, a booming voice um larger than life personality and both like personality and in stature is a big guy love to work out very very muscly and <laughs> was proud of that um the titian uh, went on to, uh, I think he worked for a little bit in Alberta before getting on the national stage on TSN where he worked for the better part of around 30 years. Uh, was certainly well known uh, on the uh, TSN Sports Center before a Sports Center. It was called Sports Desk. Um, worked with a variety of uh, teammates like Jennifer Hedger, James Duffy, Rod Smith, and others throughout the years. Uh, just an incredible guy uh, who loved his job, had tons of passion for sports, uh, just doing those highlight reels, uh, you know, night after night after night. Like he, uh, he just loved it. And back, I think it was, I want to say about maybe three years ago or so, uh, or two and a half, three years ago, he had taken time off because he did discuss publicly on, on the air that he had, uh, that he was diagnosed with cancer, uh, took a year away from the job, took a year off, uh, went through treatments. He came back, um, his first show back, he talked about the fact that the, the cancer had metastasized and it wasn't going to be the kind of cancer where you could ring the bell and say, you're, you know, you beat it and you're, you moved on. Uh, it was already spread through a lot of his body, but he was at a point with his treatments where he felt great um, and wanted to get back to doing what he absolutely loved, and that was you know being at the desk, doing the highlight reels, uh, you know connecting with viewers and his coworkers every single night. And he did that. He came back. He worked back for TSN for about another, I think, about a year. Um, and then I believe it was in December uh, when he was last on the air, um, kind of quietly went off. Of course, a lot of his teammates at work probably knew that he may or may not be back. But I know for viewers like myself, wasn't really aware of that at the time. And um, of course, recently, uh, obviously things took a turn for the worse. And then we found out that he passed away on Wednesday. So they're doing a tribute show on TSN tonight. It's uh, been made available to all regions. There's no regional block or anything. So you can check that out online. If you uh, don't have access to TSN or you didn't see it, or if you're not in Canada or whatnot. Um, but yeah, uh, Dutchie was a, a heck of a personality. I'd of course never met the man, but I felt like I knew him. He's just one of those legendary broadcasters that was one of those guys I always watched growing up and was one of many who certainly inspired me to want to get in front of a microphone and talk sports, which I do now every day for a living here on YouTube. So certainly, uh, rest in peace, Darren Detition, a uh, big personality, just looked like he was real fun to be around. And uh, certainly that you know famous voice of his that heard so many years on TSN will be something that I'll never forget because it's obviously ingrained in me after all those uh, all those nights and days of watching the highlight reel. So I certainly want to uh, extend our condolences to his uh, friends and family. Uh, and it was longtime partner, Kate Bernas, who also works at TSN. He's got three kids um, that he was very proud of as well. And just everybody, um, you know, this, that's, that's too many, you know, people in the broadcasting world that's, uh, that we've lost recently. So it's a huge loss for sure. The Canadian broadcasting uh, platform is just not quite the same in the sports world without uh, the big personality of Darren Detition. So I certainly want to acknowledge his passing and just uh, acknowledge how much of an influence and just, uh, you know, fun that he appeared to be. Like I said, he's one of those guys you watch on TV. Like we, we don't, as viewers, we, we don't know them, know them, 
but they make you feel like they know them because they connect their audience so well. So just uh, a real sad day in Canadian sports broadcasting. Um, on to the other news. We had another big game last night in the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, the Colorado Avalanche were fighting for their lives and forced a game six against the upstart Dallas Stars. The Stars have been a strong team, winning three straight games in that series and taking a commanding 3-1 to one lead. But after kind of getting the shell shock in game five, Losing to Valerie Nishushkin, Devon Taves with, with an illness. The team did not look right at all. They had a horrible game. Uh, they bounced back really, really well. 4-1 to one win. McKinnon was strong. McCarr had a phenomenal game. Um, and everybody kind of you know, kind of did what they were supposed to do. And they had a really good game and kept Dallas at bay. So uh, we'll get a game six. Uh, of course, for them, we've got a couple other game sixes coming tonight, or game, a game six and a game five tonight. We've got Boston versus Florida, and we've got the Oilers versus the Canucks. Uh, with the Oilers, they appear to be going back to Calvin Pickard again. Uh, I don't think there's really any changes on that side. Rick Tockett is changing his lineup after not and really liking how the team played in game Number four, I believe it looks like Pedersen's going to move to the wing with Elias Lindholm. Uh, so they're going to, which to me, I, I don't know. I, I like the idea in a way because Lindholm can be like the fixer, if you will, to kind of help him get going. But uh, they didn't want to break up the top line of uh, Messer, Besser, Miller, and Suter. But that other line, which was uh, Lindholm playing a lot with uh, Garland and Joshua, was really good too. So that's why Pedersen was kind of stuck on the third line with maybe some weaker line mates. But... Uh, yeah, so Talk has decided to break up basically three of the lines and make changes. Hoglander's coming in, Di Giuseppe's coming in, and Pat Colson, I believe, is going in as well. Lafferty's coming out, Mikheyev is coming out. Um, so it's going to be a different looking lineup. Noah Juleson comes back out. Uh, Susie will be back uh, after serving his one game suspension as well. So they're going to be an interesting game there to see how. Uh, obviously, one team's going to take a 3 2 lead. Who's it going to be as the series shifts back to Vancouver? Boston and Florida is going to be interesting. Um, I know there's uh, some talk around Sam Bennett, obviously. Um, you know, I think he was dealing with something. I expect he's likely going to play. Um, obviously, game six is going to be a big game tonight. I don't expect a whole lot of changes, but Boston's Brad Marchand, I do believe, is going to play tonight. He was uh, talking to the media today and he said some things that were. Very um, refreshing, in my opinion, because the things that you kind of know, but nobody ever wants to say. And he said his, his words were, nobody wants to say it, but trying to hurt other players is part of playoff hockey. And when he was asked about Bennett injuring him, he says that Bennett got away with one. He still obviously feels that Bennett did sucker punch him. But he also said at the same time that, like, you know, he just admitted that you're trying to hurt the other team, whether you want to publicly admit that or not, it's part of the game. And he admitted that, you know, if you can injure other players on the team and as injuries pile up, it gives your team an advantage. And at the same time, he said he probably would have done the same thing. And when it comes to his injury, he said, you know, basically shit happens. You know, uh, it's just the way it goes. He's just a very raw, honest discussion with Marshan and like he said he said the th things that people already kind of know but nobody wants to say um and he said when it comes to the physicality in the playoffs being as much as it is he said if you don't like it don't play in the playoffs because that's just the way it is so very very interesting comments there from Brad Marshan I'll be curious to see how the Bruins respond in trying to force a game seven now of course the Memorial Cup of course one of the harder trophies in Canada and told all sports to win is uh, set now with all the Canadian Junior Leagues having their league champions with the Moose Jaw Warriors winning the Western Hockey League title uh, last night we also saw recently the London Knights and the won the OHL championship as well uh, and of course the Quebec League champions this year is Drummondville and of course Saginaw Spear are the host team so um gonna be a fun interesting time there lots of great uh prospects to be put on display coming up here in the next few weeks uh another quick note about vancouver as well uh, connects insider rick dollywall was reporting today that there is some rumblings but the team has not confirmed it as of yet that they may be firing ahl uh, head coach Jeremy Colleton, of course, who's uh, for Abbotsford. Um, they've had good teams down there. They've made the playoffs. Of course, lately this year, especially, the Canucks have had a lot of call-ups, including a couple top goalies. So it uh, might seem a little bit unfair. I know they were not in favor of that news. So uh, when him and his colleague Don Taylor were talking about it on the show. So we'll see um, what comes from it. But the team would not talk about it or comment it here 
as of yet. Uh, some notes around the Los Angeles Kings. Uh, we got word today that they have parted ways with assistant coach Trent Yanni, which is not a huge surprise. Uh, Trent Yanni, of course, is a longtime assistant and right-hand man to Todd McClellan. Uh, has worked with Todd for quite a long time. Um, so, of course, we don't know for sure if Jim Hiller is going to be sticking around or not. It sounds like the odds are favorable based on comments from Rob Blake. Um I think the odds are pretty good. Uh, sound, but they may talk to a few outside candidates just to be sure. Uh, a big part of what they want to do in L.A., listening to Rob Blake uh, speak previously, was that they want to make sure they don't lose or give up too much of their defensive identity. I know the players want to get away from the 1-3-1 system, and they very well might do that but because they also need to figure out a way to be more offensive. But they want to be more offensive without sacrificing too much of the defense. And listening to, of course, how uh, basically Hiller's you know, plan to do that, the pitch to Blake will determine if he remains on with the team. But like I said, based on the, the uh, local reporters and what the belief was out there, I think the odds are favorable for Hiller to stay. Uh, with DJ Smith joining them as an assistant coach earlier um, or a little later in the season after Hiller became the full-time well, I guess the interim, I guess, after he took over from Todd McClellan. Um, I believe the contract that they did with DJ Smith also had a team option for the coming season. So if they keep Hiller, they're likely going to keep DJ. Of course, DJ is also a former defenseman. Uh, likely will be his responsibility with the with the team. And, of course, Yanni is a former defenseman as well. So given the relationship of Yanni to McClellan and DJ to uh, Hiller, they worked together before in Toronto. It just kind of makes sense Yanni moves on. And DJ likely stays with Hiller, assuming that Hiller keeps the head coaching job. Um, so wherever Todd McClellan lands, and he's been interviewing in a lot of places, we know that it wouldn't be shocking if he brings Trent Yanni with him. Uh, another quick note on the LA Kings as well, according to the fourth period and Dave Pagnona, um, they're saying that it seems likely at this point after the re-signing of David Riddick yesterday that there's a good chance that they move on from goaltender Cam Talbot. Um, it didn't sound like their belief was, and Dennis Bernstein, who works for the fourth period as well, connected with the Kings. It, it just they didn't have the impression they were going to bring both goalies back. Um, I mean, it's not a completely closed door in Talbot returning, but the belief is that there's lots of goalies they're interested in on the trade market, including Lena Salmark. UC Saros, Philip Gustafson, that they're more likely to go down the trade market and try to pick up one of those guys and move on from Talbot. So we'll see what they end up doing, but that's kind of the general consensus of what they're likely to do right now. Um, so time will tell. The Bill Masterton Award winner has been announced, and it's uh, former Coyotes goaltender Connor Ingram. I say former because they're now uh, Utah or Utah HC or whatever we want to call them uh, for right now since they don't have a team name but uh, Connor Ingram was a, technically this past season was a Coyote so he'll be the last Coyote to win a major award um, of course you know Ingram was a well-deserving recipient and uh, you know finalist along with the other guys that were on the uh, ballot as well but uh, Ingram nearly retired uh, not that long ago and it was just all due to being undiagnosed uh he was going through a lot of issues and until you take time to seek the right help and get a diagnosis so you can properly deal with it, it you know sometimes you try to struggle with that so he had an undiagnosed um uh, ocd and a lingering depression before seeking help through the nhl nhlpa assistance program which he does offer a lot of credit to helping him get back on track and get things turned around and kind of saved his career so to speak so he's in a much better place now and able to uh, to manage these things so that he can play and doesn't affect him like it used to so certainly congrats to connor ingram uh nice to see uh, somebody can be recognized. That's the true definition of perseverance and dedication to the game. Like I said, the other guys that were nominated and finalists as well, including Oliver Shillington, would have been a phenomenal option too. Like I said, they're all great stories, all great options. It was hard to pick a winner this year, but Ingram certainly is a good one. Uh, we do have a signing as well. The uh, couple of them actually, the Lightning have signed. Uh, Mitchell Chafee uh, gets a two-year contract. It's a one-way deal, 800000 So we know the Lightning like to have their... You know, a number of bottom six guys on multi-year deals under a million bucks. And obviously, he's been in the organization a little while. So, to get a one-way deal for that kind of money is, is good for him. Uh, it's a good opportunity and a good option for them to, to work with their tight cap situation. And the New York Islanders have landed arguably the biggest European free agent 
of the offseason here, signing uh, former KHL star Maxim Siplikov. Uh, he's a six foot three winger. Uh, he gets a one year entry level contract since he's new to the NHL, 25 years of age. Uh, scored 30 goals, 47 points, and 65 KHL games last year. Uh, has good size, good strength, good goal scorer. You know, sometimes not all these KHL stars come over and have the immediate success, um, but he could be a real steal for the Islanders. We know that the Islanders certainly want to invigorate their offense. They need a new, at least, you know, uh, ideally more than one, but they need to make some changes to their top six, top nine to get some more offensive skill in there. And this is a free way of doing it on a cheap contract. Now, it's only one year. If things go well for him and he's having a good season, then certainly in January they can look at an extension, um, sort of what we saw in Andre Kuzmenko, for example, uh, when he first landed in Vancouver. If he can be anything like Kuzmenko even, uh, which I know at times has been inconsistent, but for the most part a pretty good player, you know, they might have a really good find there. So we'll see. Siplikov had a lot of interest. There was believed to be around a dozen NHL teams that had varying degrees of interest and had uh, met with them at some point, including a couple of Canadian teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens. I know last week there was talk that of the Canadian teams, at least the Hams were considered to be a front runner. Ultimately, the Islanders were the successful ones here and get themselves a pretty good player. So Siplikov to the Islanders is now confirmed for next year. Um, another big rumor that's going around as well is, that, of course, we know the Columbus Blue Jackets are in the market for a new general manager. And we talked a couple days back that one name that was being floated around that's had um, some talks with the team and might be one of the leading contenders was former Habs GM Mark Bergevin. Well, another name has emerged, and according to Andy Strickland, who's a well-connected uh, NHL reporter, that the whispers of Ken Holland going to Columbus just won't go away. It seems like they're getting stronger here by the day. Now, it's pretty well given that at the end of the season, he is not going to return to Edmonton. Uh, it's believed, of course, with their new structure, having a new CEO, um, that you know essentially things are likely going to change in the structure. And uh, Holland was not expected by many to remain with the Oilers in a GM type of uh, role beyond this year i think his contract might be expiring as well if i'm not mistaken or they might have considered making the move sooner but holland's time at edmonton by many was expected to come to a close after this season I, a lot of people thought he may retire but i know some times like even when he was uh, in detroit before he ended up going to edmonton once he was kind of pushed into that president's role um when eiserman first came on board some people thought he might retire then, but it's maybe not the case. Uh, so we'll see what Ken Holland does uh, if he ends up being the GM in Columbus. Is certainly somebody with a ton of experience that we can say. Of course, uh, you know, there's lots of success. Is there missteps? Is there contracts that didn't work out or trades that didn't work out? Sure, you could probably critique just about any GM in league history to go through that. But at the same time, he's done a lot well and been very successful at the same rate. So we'll see if that persists or not. And I'll kind of transition us well into the rumor mill because I do want to talk a bit about Columbus and some of the things they need to do, which could end up being Ken Holland's job if he indeed does become the next general manager of the hockey club. I know I've seen lots of chatter today. We've kind of mentioned this before. Um, looking at some articles about the possibility of Johnny Gaudreau getting traded this offseason. Now, if that's the case, like we've talked about with Mitch Barner, he's going to have full say where he goes. He does have a full no-move clause. But there's a major argument to be made that Johnny Gaudreau maybe doesn't make sense for him to be there. Um, he still has five years left. He signed a seven-year deal. He's on two years there. He's not putting up the numbers like he used to in Calgary. Even there's some teams he was on in Calgary where he was not the greatest, not on the greatest teams, and he was still a driver of play, driver of offense, and you know, racking up a lot of points. And he's not doing that anymore. So certainly, he still has skill. He can still play. A lot of it is what's around him. It just where he's at in his life and where his career does it make sense for him to be in Columbus? I personally don't think it does. And I was shocked that he went there in the first place. But at that point, you know, Yarmo Kakalina was still the GM, and they saw an opportunity to kind of retool and get back into playoff contention. And, well, that's never happened. In fact, things have gotten dramatically worse. Um, you know, he's making $9.75 million for five more years, so it's going to be a tough contract to move when Goudreau's numbers have been down. And he does have a full no move as well. So it's something that may be a little less likely to happen, but I'm sure that it's going to be a conversation that, uh, the new GM and John Davidson 
and the rest of the staff there are going to have to have. Uh, I mean, they have to look at the fact that, you know, not only is the team in a spot where it really bottomed out this year, but they got Patrick Line. You know, he's a lot of question marks around him. He's taking time away from the sport. He's in the player assistance program, or he was anyway. Like, is Line going to be able to bounce back and be anything like he was? Elvis Burns Lickens, their top goaltender, has requested a trade last year. Are they going to honor that this offseason? Like, there's just a lot more change this team can go through. And given where things are at with Gaudreau, does it make sense? It might be even if even if the player and the team feel like it did make sense for him to possibly look at moving on, it will still be a challenge, and it may not happen. But at the same time, I do expect the whispers and the conversations to pop up throughout the offseason. It might be something that we do here further down the line. So we'll see. Uh, when it comes to the Montreal Canadiens, of course, we've heard lots of talk, lots of speculation and rumors that Ken Hughes will attempt to make another splash at the NHL draft and try to acquire another top young talent and player who's, you know, something comparable to what we saw with Kirby Dock or Alex Newhook, somebody who's not necessarily on a rookie contract, but somebody who's still in their, you know, under 25 at the very least that is maybe needing a fresh start. Maybe is somebody who, you know, is not thriving with their existing club and could benefit from a change. Well, I saw a recent article about that as well, suggesting it could be Philadelphia Flyers winger Joel Fairby. Uh, the Flyers, we know, uh, had an interesting year this year. Um, Fairby's numbers have struggled under John Tortorella. Um, not like he wasn't struggling a little bit before, but I think there's a lot of untapped potential. With Joel Faraby. I really do. Um, you know, he's making $5 million per year. He's got four years left, so it's not a crazy contract. He's still fairly young. Um, certainly at the World Championships right now as well with Team USA. Getting a chance to play with some other great young talent like a Cole Caulfield, for example. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in Philly that Matt Bay Mitchkoff might be able to come over to the Flyers. Uh, sooner than expected. There's even a there's some people that think that even the some coming season it could happen. I mean we that's not confirmed by any means, but I know there's people out there saying it's possible and it could happen. And if he's gonna come to Philly sooner than later, then maybe the Flyers would consider moving a guy like Faraby, who's I wouldn't say he's not lived up to his contract, but he's certainly not thriving the way that they thought he would. Uh, and could be a great target. I mean, he's a left winger, left shot, decent size, six feet, one eighty six, good contract. Uh, you know, a player that would be familiar with a lot, at least some of the Habs players already. You know, could he be a target? I mean, we've talked about Trevor Zegers, and we've talked about the fact that you know, to some degree, it makes sense, but I know a lot of people feel that Zegers isn't the best fit. And I do understand that argument and see why people would say that. Uh, but a guy like Fairby, on the other hand, would be a completely different type of player. Might be a much better fit. And now what the react or the uh, the price to get him would be, that's tough to say. I mean, Montreal could possibly pay Philly in terms of draft capital prospects. We know Philly would probably love to have a solid young defenseman. They have several that they could consider moving. We know that guys like Gooley, Jack Guy and probably Reinbacher are probably off limits. Otherwise, you're looking at whether it be Harris, Struble, um, you know, one of those guys, Barron. I'm not sure which one they, the Flyers would prefer in this case, but you know, one of the young defensemen, not named Gooley or Jack Guy uh, or Reinbacher, would be probably a starting point for them to talk about. Um, maybe with a you know a good pick in there as well, I, something along those lines. So we'll see if Montreal and Philadelphia have those conversations. To me, it does make some sense. And we know that what the plan is for Montreal. We know they likely want to add a top six forward. We know they likely want to have it somebody under 25 who's uh, under ideally under a good contract or one they can sign to a good contract. So there's a lot of things here, a lot of box checked off here for what Fairby could bring. So we'll see if anything comes from that. In Toronto, one thing we can say for sure, there's reports that the Leafs will be moving on from free agent defenseman TJ Brody. Definitely fair to say he struggled down the stretch. And as much as he's had a solid career that the Leafs don't see him as being somebody in their top six um, anymore for defense. And he'll be able to move on elsewhere if he can find another home, another contract. But another option for the Leafs uh, is there's some talk now for goaltending. That's pretty much a given that Samson is not going to be back after the comments of Brad Tree leaving at their team press conference there last week. I think that's a given. They like Joseph Wall. Uh, again, somebody they believe in, they trust. 
but always is getting hurt. And I think it's fair to say that they're not going to go into this season without having another goaltender who can make sure that they have a strong tandem and that if one of them is injured, they're in good hands. A couple of names have come up. Obviously, we talked about a potential Marner trade to Nashville for UC Saros. Well, that may or may not happen. That's a big, you know, uh, there's a lot of moving parts to that kind of trade. It's hard to say with any certainty that it would actually come together. Uh, an easier way to do this would be look on the UFA market. And there is some names out there that the Leafs might be able to sign with a not too big of a price tag that could come in and do on a, you know, maybe a two year deal, two or three year contract, nothing that's too crazy. Uh, that could be a huge help uh, and be a 1A, 1B with Wall, like Laurent Brassois out of Winnipeg. Phenomenal numbers. Anthony Stolars in Florida. Again, phenomenal numbers. Anthony Stolars was a really slow getting his career going because he dealt with a lot of injuries. But the last number of years, he's been able to stay healthy. Uh, smaller roles probably help with that. Stolarz uh, had a 927 save percentage for the Florida Panthers last year, um, backing up Sergei Bobrovsky. They still have Spencer Knight, who you know took a break from hockey, had to go through the player assistance program. He's come back. He's played in the minors. At some point, they got to give Knight a chance to shine in the NHL, in my opinion. I mean, he is signed to a $4.5 million per year contract. So, you know, with Stolarz looking for a decent raise after a strong season, he may a good chance he won't be able to stay in Florida. So could a team like Toronto scoop him up? Makes sense that it might be an option. And Brassois, of course, he was, you know, partnered with Connor Hellebach, who he's played in Winnipeg a fair bit over his career. He was in Vegas for a while as well. So he's had, at times, had a chance to be a starter, maybe not for a whole season, but he's had his chances. He's also worked well in a tandem. Um, had a 927 save percentage this year and a 2.0 goals against with three shutouts. Like, he's really found his game in the last number of years between his time in Winnipeg and Vegas and could be another terrific option. I mean, Winnipeg would probably love to keep him, but it's hard to give him a, some more of a substantial role when you have Connor Hellebuck. Hellebuck's going to play a huge part of the schedule. Um, so it would be a loss for the Jets for sure, but it's going to be tough to keep him looking for a raise after putting up those type of numbers. And again, it's not going to be a huge number, but big enough that you know some of these teams need to have their their backup goaltenders making around a million or so at most. And while well, Toronto could be afford to give him a little bit more than that, given the fact that he would partner with Wall and Wall's making under a million. So even if they get him for three to four million or something along those lines on a you know multi year two three year contract would probably be a great deal for them. So certainly look for Toronto to explore the free agent market, and one of these goalies could be their prime target. It makes a ton of sense if they can do it, because um, you know, even if they do make a Marner trade, outside of Nashville, it's unlikely they're going to get a goaltender. We did talk about Marner trades that would involve Nashville that would give them a goalie, possibly Vegas, because Vegas, you know their Vegas is going to be interested in everybody because they always are. If that worked out, they could probably get like a Logan Thompson or something, part of the package. Um, you know, Otherwise, there's a lot of teams that wouldn't have that piece to give them. So they can't bank on that. And because a yeah, big part of that is Mitch Marner has a full no-move clause. So if they do trade him, he's going to dictate where he goes. And the team that he's willing to go to may not have a goaltender that really fits the bill of what they're looking for. So at the end of the day, it's going to be tricky and challenging. They're going to have to explore other options and have plans A, B, and C lined up. And this, to me, is a pretty good plan B, if not plan A. You can't bank on a trade coming back for one of those top guys at all. It's almost it's very difficult to work out. So let me know your thoughts on that and everything else discussed here today down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.